Greetings, Marsh here, and welcome to episode 391 of my modded Factorio playthrough. This is going to be the final send-off for the factory in the form of a factory tour now that we have completed the main game. My intent is to go through the entire factory and basically cover every process that's in play here and give you a nice overview slash tutorial of Angel Bob's, both what goes into it and just how you can potentially solve the different difficulties that it gives you. Of course, it would be nice to see the factory active, and we are now done with our faster than light propulsion systems and the 2 million research that was required for that. So now a lot of these repeatable researches are going to seem rather small. I don't really want to upgrade the artillery. I mean, I do, but I'm worried that increasing the range is really going to tank the UPS when it angers all of the biters, because it certainly does. Ideally, we'd want something big and expensive. Well, doing the worker cargo size, or better yet, the biggest trash research we can do, is to increase our character's trash inventory slots. That will use all of the same packs that we used in our infinite research. Although upgrading things like transport drones does help, I'd rather show the factory in its final state rather than make it better than it was. So as a general overview of Angel Bobs, they specifically call it that because Angels and Bobs are two separate mod packs that are commonly put together. The Angel side tends to cover the production of raw resources, the special ores, processing the ores, sorting them into the ores we're familiar with, like copper and iron, processing those into more efficient ingots, and then more efficient coils. All of that is Angels. Also, a lot of the Petrochem stuff is Angels as well, and you can definitely tell that a lot of the Angels machines have the A's on them. So that's your hint about which mod made those. Unfortunately, the Bob stuff aren't going to give you B's. Bob's tends to cover more of the final output side of things, like these higher tier batteries that you can make, two tiers higher than vanilla, and also a lot of the higher tiers of everything that you can get. So you see how we have a burner assembler machine here, and then tiers one, two, three, then four, five, and six. And that applies to just about everything in the game, where everything from robo ports and the robots themselves all have multiple tiers. And that's more of what Bob's contributes. So if you take those two mods and put them together, you have a rather cohesive uh, set of mods. And they are very carefully crafted to work well with each other. So let's jump in here and talk about how you refine these ores into plates. I like to split the process into three different steps because there is logic applied to each one and it's not as simple as you start with a resource here, it goes up the line, and then at the very end you get iron. I mean, you could do that, but there's a lot that goes into it and you can see all of the logic that just goes into making iron where if you have a straight through process for this, each setup is going to be very complicated and big, whereas in this method, each setup is its own thing, and then there's logic connected to them, and then this snake of belts going through all of this. And the way it's basically solved is by having multiple buses, and I suppose I should cover that too, about what is the style of this factory. Because it's very straight, so I wouldn't necessarily call it spaghetti, and it's certainly not something like city block. So what I would like to call it is a multi-bus factory, because it certainly has buses, and if it has a main bus, it's probably this one right here. And this isn't even all of the resources that we have, it's just the resources that the main bus would need. And specifically, the main bus is the thing that's making all of the items that we need, like all of the manufacturing machines, you know, tanks, inserters, belts, all of that kind of stuff. There are separate buses, that are smaller but for different things. This long thing right here that does a turn of shame is our science bus. It is responsible for making all of the science packs and that's all it does. This bus over here is the intermediates bus. It's making items that use input resources that are uncommon. So it basically takes complication and puts it off to the side here. But there is a tiny bus over here that is responsible for making puffers, and we'll cover that later. This big, essentially, circle bus it almost looks like. It's not really a circle, it's just some belts go this way and then some go up. It does another turn of shame because we ran out of space. This whole thing just makes circuits and modules. That's it. 
So the circuits and modules bus is bigger than the main bus in the factory. It's pretty much the biggest thing in Angel Bob's, and you always run out of space when it comes to circuits and modules. So it's really important to put it off to the side and let it have a lot of room to grow. And it even didn't have enough. It needed more than twice as much as it started with. So this bus up here is the ingots bus. It takes the finished ingots and then sends them to the different processes to make coils, which are essentially plates. This isn't really a bus right here, but I guess it kind of looks like it, but it's just the ores being delivered to their one location that they're needed. But this down here totally is a bus. It's basically a sorting bus where all of these different ores are being produced and why we're producing so many types, I'll explain, that they need to be sorted properly to where they go. So you can definitely see how all of the manganese is being pulled off right here, leaving just iron and copper, which keep going, and then the copper gets pulled out and leaving just the iron. And then these ones in the here to pick up any extras, which should not ever make it back here. This bus right here is for the angel's ores that have been processed to their various tiers. This kind of is a bus, but it's basically just a whole bunch of belts of crushed stone. <laughs> so I don't know if that really counts, but you can definitely see it as a solid belt of resources that are being sent down here to stone processing. It was designed around concentrated buses for where a lot of activity was happening and then used other logistics when there was less activity. So in Angels, you don't mine iron or copper out of the ground. You mine the special Angels ores and there is one train and one train station for each type. And if you hover over each one, they will tell you what you can ultimately get out of each kind. So Sapphire can eventually give you iron, copper, silicon, nickel, titanium, and tungsten. In addition to the sapphirite, we have jivalite, steratite. This train is empty, but it's just because it's not being used. The ores are actually being manually sent here. This is crotinium, rubite, and bobmonium. And from those six ores, you can create every ore in the game that you need. Most of the factory uses one plus four trains, so it has a single locomotive in the front. You can see this is tier three locomotive, so they're much faster than the normal ones. And then four cars behind them without a locomotive in the back to go backwards. So all of the trains are one direction only in the factory. And for the most part, all of the trains are that one plus four. However, the one exception are the ore trains, which have an acid wagon on the back. Similar to how you would mine uranium in Vanilla Factorio, there are infinite ore patches from angels that you can mine where you put in acid and it has a yield which would be similar to like an oil patch where it runs out eventually. So the final car on the back of each of these has the acid that goes into that ore. So Bobmodium uses sulfuric acid, Rubite uses nitric acid, if Crotinium was running it would be using hydrochloric acid, more sulfuric for the steratite. Oh, the train left <laughs> so he can't take it. But Hydrofluoric goes into Jivalite and Sulfuric goes into the Sapphirite. Let's see, let's take this one for now and just go on a little drive. It gets going. <laughs> it really only needs the one locomotive. Of course, we could have just teleported here, but just wanted to show it in action is all. I'm making heavy use of these loaders and what I like to call balancing warehouses, or I guess these are storehouses, but the idea where you have multiple belts going in a loader into a large building, which is a single container, and then it perfectly splits. Well, not perfectly, because there are situations where it won't be even. Under normal circumstances, it will properly balance any combination of belts. And I feel like this is a much easier solution than having a belt balancer book for every combination of belts. Especially because we're already in modded Factorio and we already have access to these. So these special buildings are from AAI Industry. And they have, in addition to these 4x4s, 2x2s, and 6x6s. And I like how they just all have this look to them. They kind of look the same and they seem to fit the aesthetic of the game better than any other warehouse mod that I've tried. And specifically, they're also huge, where this one right here is a 512 slot building. So you can do a lot logistically with that. And then near the end of the game, you unlock the logistics versions of them too. It's kind of hard to see. Maybe I should uh, look in at a different unused stereotype patch here where the stuff in the middle 
it actually glows in the dark if it was nighttime. And I guess it is nighttime because we have night vision. We can't really tell. <laughs> but taking it off, you can see that it glows in the dark. Some of our factory still has lights on it, and I'm using the clockwork mod to make darkness completely black. So if you've watched some of the early episodes and you're frustrated by that, sorry, but <laughs> I enjoyed it, but I understand why other people didn't. But a lot of the other parts of the factory have no light at all. Like this, you just see the glow of the machines. And the reason for that is we simply had night vision and Bob gives you multiple tiers of night vision. And this is the third tier, which is essentially day vision where you can't even tell if it's day or night anymore. So in the middle, there is that infinite patch and the miners that are atop it are using the mining fluid to mine. And you see some of these other patches that are gray. This is the depleted stereotype and all of the resources can be depleted using the prospector mod and the way that works is that you can only access a couple of the materials in the beginning and then when you scan it with the prospector radar you access deeper and deeper versions so right now if we hover over this there's still 1.2 million of stereotype here that needs to be scanned to be accessed so all of that together meant that each one of these mines has been quite deep like 17 million or here but because of prospector it's more like 80 million not to mention the incredible amount of infinite ore in the middle here. So as a result, we only need one mine for each type of ore. We don't have to go running around in Biterland looking for more mines. On one hand, that is a little sad, but on the other, I would say that probably my least favorite part of Factorio is running around making mining bases everywhere because your patches ran out. So I don't terribly mind the fact that I kind of made these too deep and too big to where <laughs> We really haven't had any issues getting ores at all. The issues have been processing the ores, but actually getting the ores hasn't been hard. So let's talk about how we process each one of these ores. That the first stage is taking the raw ore that you mined out of the ground, doing some processing to it, and then sorting it, essentially getting the vanilla ores that you would expect. So like iron and copper. And there's some other ones like lead and tin, but the idea is that they are in their ore form. So how do we get to that point? Well, you have to process them. And if you go to resource refining here, you can see all of the recipes and all of the machines that go into this, that there are four tiers of each processing type. So like with sapphirite, the first tier is crushed sapphirite. The second tier is the sapphirite chunks. The third tier is the sapphirite crystals. And the fourth tier is the purified sapphirite. And you can do these tiers to all six ore types, giving you a total of 24 different types of ores that you might have. And each of those 24 can be sent through an ore sorter to get your ores out. So like with Sapphirite, if it's tier one or the crushed Sapphirite, four pieces go in and you get two iron, one copper, and then a slag, which is a byproduct we'll talk about later. If you refine it further into chunks, so now you put in six, you get the two iron and the one copper, but also you get a silicon and a nickel and a slag. But less of the ore turned into slag than it did on this previous tier. So you're getting a higher output out of it, but also you're getting more junk. Just if that junk is something you actually wanted or not is the question. If you turn it into crystals, eight go in, you get three iron and then one copper, one silicon, one nickel, and then one titanium and also that slag. And if you take it to the final tier, you put nine in and then get a tungsten out of that and no slag. So if you process it enough, you'll get no slag at all. And which one of those you want to run? Depends. You might think the next higher tier is the best one to do, but that's actually not the case. And that's why we have so many sorting methods. And it's also why these methods have been split apart from each other because there's logic that's attached. In addition to all of that, there's also 16 different types of resources that you can make by mixing the ores together, which will give you up to eight things that you can also process. So let's talk about all of this stuff here. Each tier of ore processing works mostly the same between the different ores. The only thing that changes is certain parts of the recipe. But the very first thing you have to do is crush the ore. And you see these machines are very fast with lots of speed modules. So what happens is two ores go in, you get two crushed ores, and then a crushed stone on the way out, and that crushed stone is your first byproduct you'll have to deal with. And stone processing by itself is a hugely complicated topic, which we will get into later, but for now, just keep in mind that that crushed stone needs to go somewhere. And all of the different ores work the same way, where when you crush them, you get a crushed stone out of it, and you'll have to do something with it. The second tier 
is taking that crushed ore and adding purified water, which will then give us the appropriate chunk and also some type of geode. In this case, for sapphite, it's a blue geode and also sulfuric wastewater. So the water goes in, but then becomes dirty on the way out. And the geode is kind of like that crushed stone from the previous step. It's another stone product that you have to deal with. And this stage, the second stage is probably the most complicated part just because you have two inputs and three outputs and two of those are fluids. So it's a lot of stuff that has to be in here and a lot of filter inserters and just kind of a lot of work. And don't worry about the geodes for now. We'll come back later to cover that. And then from there, you take the chunks and add an acid to it. In Sapphire's case, it's sulfuric acid and then it turns into sapphire crystals. And that gives us our three tiers of crystals, and each one is being sent into a special warehouse here. And I guess I should cover that too, that I'm actually creating all four types of ore at the same time. So we have four belts of ore going in here. One belt is going down into this bypass to be sent elsewhere. The other three are coming up. One of them is going to the bus, while two of them are going in to make chunks. And then one belt of chunks is created, and then that final belt goes through to make the crystals. So that gives us one belt of tier 1, one belt of tier 2, and one belt of tier 3. In addition to that extra belt, which is held off to the side. And I'm doing that so we can use any of these methods to create ore. Because if you look at our sorting options, let's say our goal was making silicon. We have access to three different sorting methods, but which one is the best one for silicon? It just kind of depends. When you think about it, they're all kind of bad. You're making a lot of junk just to make one silicon. And in fact, if you made chunks, you would make the least amount of junk in addition to your silicon compared to the rest of these, which make even more junk. So that's why we have all those methods. And the different colors work similarly, where the output is a purple geode and you get fluoric wastewater. This one is a yellow geode with sulfuric wastewater, and so on and so on. The way you process all of these outputs is essentially the same. First, you have to deal with all of that water. You could put it on a big pipe bus, but there's a problem with that. This one setup right here uses two water pipes full of input. So two water pipes need to go in, and two water pipes need to come out. You would have to have dozens and dozens of rows of water pipes to support all this. So when you have a factory that's this big, you need to think about the logistics and how can you make the logistics as easy as possible. So in this case, why should we send sulfuric wastewater away to be processed and then just send purified water back when we can do it right here? And that's exactly what we're doing, where these hydro plants here are processing the sulfuric wastewater and cleaning it up. It gives us 70% of the input back as purified water, 20% of it back as mineralized water, and we get a sulfur out of it. And they're putting their outputs onto this belt here. And different resources all work the same way, but you get different outputs. So like in the case of this one, we are getting the fluorite ore out, and also the mineralized water. The chloric wastewater is giving us some salt and saline water as an output in addition to that purified water. The nitric wastewater is giving us the sodium nitrate and mineralized water. So ultimately, we have our four different types of acid products coming out of this. And if you think back to the trains, the four main acids are sulfuric, nitric, hydrochloric, and hydrofluoric. So it's all kind of looped together. It's not a perfect balance, but you, you can't just process everything as you see fit. Because you see right now, we are not putting the sulfur out anymore and that's because these inserters are wired up to a circuit network that says only if we have less than 50,000 sulfur can they remove the sulfur from these buildings and the reason for that is because our ability to create sulfur is not directly linked to our ability to remove it so why create the sulfur if we don't even need it to begin with so every acid product has its destination warehouse and sends that status back to the building that is creating it to determine if it even should. Even if this was working normally, I guess we can come over here to show, we only get 70% of the purified water back. So we're losing purified water through this process and need to make more. And that is what these buildings on the bottom are for, where they take regular plain water and can filter it to give you mostly purified water and a little bit of saline water. 
And these are sized in such a way, and you can see it's turning on again because now suddenly we need more uh, acid, that both of these are sized for full power use. So if we only made enough purified water to make up for these hydro plants, then if these hydro plants weren't running, we would be short on purified water. So both of these setups can make the full amount of water that each needs. What happens if these machines aren't allowed to run to process the wastewater because we just don't need the acid components, then what? Well, there is logic connected to it, and it goes down to this Angel's Petrochem tank, because it has the A on it there, that if this tank gets above 5,000, which is 25%, it will start pumping the water away into another Angel's machine, the Clarifier. And the Clarifier is a liquid dump for angels. Not all liquids go through a clarifier, but most watery liquids do. So if you have too much of any given product and you just don't need it anymore, you can make it go away with a clarifier. And you absolutely do because it's impossible to have a completely closed loop system with angels here. Just too much is going on and it's not worth the effort. Shouldn't say it's impossible. I'm sure someone can do it, but I can confidently say it's not worth your time. <laughs> Just put it through a clarifier. So we covered the first three tiers, and tier four was tacked on at the very end, mainly because we didn't need very much of it, so there wasn't much of a point to making a huge setup, but basically this is just the final tier where it requires no input resource, it just requires time to process the final ore. And it was done kind of like an afterthought, but it works. One other thing that you can do is do the ore mixtures, and that is why we have these six extra belts that are being sent off to the side because the first step of the ore mixture is you need to take the crushed ores and you can make the ferrous mixture by adding sapphire, jivalite, and rubite and you can make the cupric mixture with steratite, crotinium, and bobmonium and that will create the first tier of the mixtures which is being sent off to the side and then more belts are going through where you can make tier two by taking that mixture and adding a milling drum and then crush it down into a powder. That will give you a used up drum on the end, and then those used drums can go through a machine and if you add lubricant to it, it turns back into another drum. So it doesn't use drums, it just borrows them. And you can do that for each ore. And then to get tier three is a two-step process for mixtures, and it requires an incredible amount of inputs. So first the previous tier, or the ferrous powder, plus it requires tier two, of sapphirite, jivalite, and rubite, plus sulfuric acid, plus thermal water, and we'll get into all of that, but you add all that together, and then you get the ferrous sludge. And cupric is similar. You take that sludge and add sodium hydroxide to it, which finally gives you the ferrous dust, which you can use, and also creates sulfuric wastewater as a byproduct, which is handled the same way as you would do it anywhere else. And that's the tier three. Tier four is a four step process. So it took only one step to do tier one, one step to do tier two, two steps for tier three, and then four steps for tier four. But what you do is you take that ferrous dust and mix in three of the tier three ores, plus more sulfuric acid, to make a slurry. That slurry has water added to it and a filter, in this case a ceramic filter, to create a spent filter concentrate and sulfuric wastewater. Those filters can be cleaned by simply adding purified water to them. So you don't consume filters, you just borrow them, like the milling drums. And to save issues with pipes, because it is so easy to place a water plant down anywhere you want, there's really no point to having huge buses of pipes going everywhere when you could just put a hydro plant down and either make the water you need or process the wastewater. So why make it more complicated than you have to? And then it goes through an electro-winning cell here where you add ferric chloride solution, which will give you a slag and an anodized ferrous concentrate and more wastewater. And then finally, you process that concentrate into the ferrous crystals, which is tier four. And cupric works in a similar way, the difference being you need the cupric chloride solution instead. Otherwise, the recipe is very similar. So now we have covered each resource, and all of them are put onto our resource bus here, where this first group of six is for tier one, this is tier two, tier three, and then this one is empty, but if you follow it down to the end, it is filled with tier four. And then the first three tiers of the mixtures, the tier four is up here at the top. And then this middle one, if we follow it back to the origin, are these catalysts here, where mineral sludge goes in and you get a mineral catalyst, 
Crystal Seedling goes in to get a Crystal Catalyst, and then the Hybrid Catalyst is a combination of both of them. We'll cover how you make them later, but for now, keep in mind that we need them. So all of that is put onto this bus here, and all of them are attached to these strong boxes here, and they all are connected to an electrical network, and they're all basically around a thousand. You can see they're flickering like crazy. But this is important because this is the input logic. This is saying that X number of resources are available. Now they're all basically at a thousand because the factory is running in peak condition here, but it wouldn't necessarily be the case. So let's say we were creating, how about, sapphire chunks faster than we could make them. Then this warehouse number would go down and it would be reported on this wire. And the reason why we're recording everything is because the consumption of the resources depends on the status of the warehouses. And you can see this wire is continuing. So now that you have all that, we can cover creating the ores themselves. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. I would sort it into two general methods. One is regular sorting where you put in just one ore like sapphire, and then you get a mixture of ores. And this applies to every single thing you could sort. They all give you these huge mixtures of ores. However, you can instead sort for just the ore you want, like iron, by mixing in a specific combination of input ores and some form of catalyst. Generally, the higher the tier of ore, the higher the tier of minimum processing is required. So to make iron ore requires a mineral catalyst and then two of crushed sapphire and crushed jivalite, but only the crushed kind, not the higher tiers. So this is an example of why you want to process all of them, because if you replaced all of your crushed belts with, let's say, the chunks instead, then you wouldn't be able to make iron ore in this way anymore. Generally, the best way of making an ore is the one that just creates the ore you want, because then there's no byproducts you have to deal with. Although this isn't always possible, but this bus was designed in such a way to where the primary way of making ore does not go on the bus itself. It goes under it and then straight into the warehouse. This prevents the whole bus from being clogged by all these ores. So really the only ores that are in this sorting part are ores that were a byproduct of some other process and are just making it to the warehouse that they need to go in. So how do we actually decide which ore to make? Well, we look at the status of the warehouse that holds the ore and it's on this wire here. And you can also see it on circuit HUD with these ore bus numbers here. That basically the input is just saying, is the warehouse below a certain point? If so, let them through. However, it gets more complicated than that. So let's jump to the very end where things get rather complicated. How about this one right here? <laughs> the only input is the stereotype crystals and we get all of these outputs as a result. On the input side, it's got a circuit condition that's saying, do we have more than 500 stereotype crystals? If so, they can go through. And of course we do have that. But why is that there? Well, if there are multiple processes that are using these crystals, that warehouse will go below a thousand. And eventually it will go below 500. And when that happens, this process will turn off, triaging those ores and leaving them to the processes that have higher priority. So the way that a process has higher priority in this method is that the number is lower. So let's say we had two other processes, one of them was set to 750 and one of them was set to 250. The 750 method would turn off before this one did because it's at 500 and the 250 method would turn off after this one did. So by carefully deciding exactly what numbers to use, you can control the priority of each input or you could also do the same thing to control the output as well. And that's what all these combinators are for. So it looks more complicated than it is, but essentially all it's doing is creating either a start condition or a stop condition. And there's two rows of combinators. The bottom row is for this right belt and machine. The top row is for the left belt and machines, which are the stereotype crystals that we're talking about here. Because with a start condition marked by a green signal, you only need to have one start signal for this process to turn on. However, regardless of the number of start signals that may exist, if you have a single stop signal, the entire thing shuts down. This is giving it the ability to turn on and it's also giving it the ability to be forced to be shut down even if it wants to be on. And it works by taking that wire with all of the ores on them and saying, are we below, let's say 8,000 of lead? If so, 
turn on. Are we below 2000 of nickel? If so, turn on. And that also works in a triage sort of way, but it works in an inverse way. So the higher the numbers are, the higher the priority is. Let's say we had two other methods that made lead. One of them turned on at 10,000 and one turned on at six. The one that turns on at 10,000 would turn on before this method and the one that turns on at 6,000 would turn on after this method. So by carefully crafting each one of these numbers, you can control which one turns on and off. And unfortunately, that is well beyond the scope of this episode. It would probably take me an hour or two just to describe how I came up to those numbers. But I kind of touched on it before with silicon, where if our goal is to make silicon, it is not to make iron, copper, nickel, and slag. So with sapphire chunks, we're making one silicon for every six ore that goes in. But if we did it with crystals, we would get one silicon for every eight crystals that went in. Or if it's purified, it would be one silicon for every nine ore that went in. So this one is actually worse if you just want to make silicon. Now, of course, the very best method of making silicon is rubite chunks, bimonium chunks, and a crystal catalyst will just give you silicon. So that is, of course, the best way. But you can see how the level of the warehouse could decrease to the point to where these other methods are required. Either this one method would not be enough for the factory's input requirements of ore, or it could be that, let's say, what happens if we have no rubite chunks? Then what? Well, we will have bad but secondary methods that can turn on to make up for that. And that is what all this logic is for. And man, that research is going fast, but... <laughs> The number is going to get bigger and bigger, so <laughs> we have lots of trash inventory now. The stop signals are much easier. All they're doing is looking at, is one of the ores that this process can make above 80,000? If so, red signal, stop everything. Because these warehouses can hold about 100,000, if they were completely full, that 80% is about 80,000, and that is simply what is decided to be the high level. And these lights on the side will show you how many start conditions and how many stop conditions currently exist. Of course, all this stuff is turned off because they're the bad ways, but here's a good example. This green wire here is for this line, and that's for this one on the side. So we have one start condition and one stop condition. The start condition is for iron ore. That if we are below 28,000 of iron ore, and we are because we're at 26,000, this method should turn on. However, at the same time, if we go to the manganese warehouse, it is at 80,000, which is considered full. So it's not allowed to turn on. So those signals are combining and that prevents this method from running. And you can see how, as far as iron goes, although it doesn't make all iron, half of the input is iron, which is actually pretty good. So you can see why this is a method that is trying to turn on. And one other positive element of these ore mixtures is that none of them create slag. So although it takes a lot of work to get there, it saves you from dealing with slag and the inefficiency that comes along with it. Because slag is useful, but you'd rather have ore if you could. So all of the production types that create many ores need to have all of these many logics to make them work. However, the direct sorting methods, like the one that's making uranium here, it only needs to look at the warehouse and in this case, if it's below 4,000, it turns on. And we used uranium very slowly, so it just doesn't turn on very often. So we use lots of silicon, so here's a good example where it's set to 16,000, and it can make it faster than we can consume it, so it just bursts until the warehouse gets above 16,000 and then turns off. And I have the settings for Dixie Tube set to something that's very UPS friendly, so these update quite slowly. But if you want to, like, look at the actual status of the warehouse and what happens, you can see it gets above 16,000, turns off, kind of waits for a second until everything gets off the belts. The number goes down, and then those turn on. So it is working in real time. And the reason why we have all these methods, like we're following copper here, copper comes from other sources, so why not put it in the appropriate warehouse and then limit the amount of times that this needs to run? And that is the basic overview of how all this ore sorting works. Some of them have no logic at all at the bottom. Iron, for example, does not because iron is the highest priority of all of these input resources, so it doesn't need to have logic, it's just always on. And like in the case of copper, copper also has the highest input of its ores, so they don't need to have any logic. However, because they do share the catalyst with iron, 
they also have a control signal, but it's quite low, meaning its priority is high in relation to other methods. So without covering every single recipe, I can just kind of show what's being made in each area. We have two lines making iron because we need so much of it. One making copper directly, one making lead directly, one making tin directly. And then this line, half of it is for the tier one of each mixture. And then this line is making nickel. This one is silicon. And then these machines are sorting just the first tier of each crushed ore type. This one making aluminum, this one making zinc, this one making silver. And then this line is simply sorting the tier two of the ore mixtures. And then we have a drone path in the middle, so we had to split everything apart. And then after that, it's the tier three of each ore type that's being processed. This one right here is a weird one. It's pretty much the only one that works this way, but it requires a catalyst and then a ferrous powder and a jivalite chunk. So it's kind of a very weird combination of things, but that gives us fluorite. And although we get a lot of acid products from processing wastewater, ultimately it's not going to be enough, or at least you need to have the ability to make more of them, as I like to say, from nothing. In other words, you need to be able to process this acid out of thin air and you make the fluoric acid through fluorite. And that fluorite is produced as if it was an ore, like iron or copper. It's the only one that works this way, but it is interesting. That's why it's here, and it works in a weird way, but the ores don't go on the bus at all. Just they get sent to where they need to be processed. And it's using the status of its warehouse to determine if it should turn on and off. This is our line making titanium. This is for cobalt. This is for gold. This is for uranium. And then we have the standard ores, the tier three of each ore type, including the tier three of the ore mixtures as well. And then at the very end, we have the real hard stuff to make. A line for titanium, a line for thorium, and another line for titanium because we need so much. And both of them basically work together, so they're trying to get it up to 2,000. And when this warehouse goes below, they both basically turn on at the same time. This one takes a little longer to get there than the other, but it doesn't really matter. It all balances out in the end. And the input for these final ores are quite difficult. The only reason we made those purified ores to begin with was to make tungsten. And it requires three of the different purified ores and the hybrid catalyst, so it's very expensive. And to make thorium, we had to go through that super complicated process to make tier four of both ferrous crystals and cupric crystals. So some ores are not being sorted at all, as you see here. They just kind of stop. So there wasn't any more room for more types, but also, in addition, it's just not that much better. Like, why go through this effort to turn that slag into a tungsten when this is a terrible way for making tungsten? It just doesn't make any sense, so I didn't add those methods in the end. But it was mostly a space thing. I think if I would have had the space, I probably still would have put it in there, but <laughs> here we are. So that basically covers how you make ores. Now, ores do come in from other places. Some of it's coming from down here, which I'll explain later, and also some of it's coming on robot, which I will explain. But it's put in this initial warehouse, which will then put the ore onto the ore bus, and no matter which ore it is, it will eventually find where it needs to go. You also notice this wiring mess of combinators up here. They were basically used as a test signal for the related ore. I'm not sure if they still work or not, but let's see if it does. If we flip this switch, Yes, if you look on the circuit condition here, now we have 35k of gold. So it's basically ignoring what's in the warehouse and making its own signal. So let's say instead we had 85k. Now if we come back here, notice how we have some red signals? This is because these methods make gold, and now that gold is overloaded, none of these methods are allowed to turn on because it would only make the gold overload worse. In the end, these were put there in order to test all of this to make sure that it works without actually having to have any ore in there. So right now they're kind of just there and they don't really do anything. So that was a lot of work to get your ores, but now what do you do with them? Well, the second stage here is to take them from ore form and turn them into ingot form. And again, it is separated from the final stage of making plates because you can use different combinations of ores to make different plates. So they have been separated, so logic can occur. And each method works a little differently, but there's also similarities between them. They're all in the metallurgy smelting here, 
And ultimately, there are three different tiers of processing that you can do. And like, let's cover copper, for example. The first tier is you just put copper ore into a blast furnace and then copper ingots come out and that's it. So when you're at tier one, you might not even think of this as its own step because it's just one machine. However, it gets more complicated than that. At tier two, you can take processed copper, which is simply made from regular copper and add oxygen gas to it to make copper ingots. And if you do the math on that, that will be a 50% yield increase. So if a hundred copper go in, 150 copper ingots will come out rather than just 100 with the first tier. And tier three requires that you add in sulfuric acid to copper anodes, and then copper anodes are copper pellets and oxygen, and then those copper pellets come from the processed copper. So if you go through all of that, you will get a 100% increase to efficiency. So in other words, for every 100 ore that go in, you get 200 ingots on the way out. So you definitely want to do this processing whenever possible. And most of these machines have been upgraded, but you can also kind of see the scale of things and how they changed with our technologies. So like this is the copper setup right here. Now it's pretty big where four belts of copper go in and then eight belts of copper come out. Compare it to, let's say, titanium right here, where 60 ore go in and 120 ore come out. And it's just this tiny little thing. So that is what end game technology allows you to do. And there are no beacons in it because the factory doesn't have any. And I guess I haven't even mentioned that yet. <laughs> but this is a beaconless factory. There isn't a single beacon in here. I can prove it to you. See, no tier one, no tier two, no tier three. <laughs> Probably should have advertised that earlier, but I am just not a fan of beacons very much. I can talk about that for an hour about why I'm not, but they just seem super overpowered to me. Not very good for game balance. It clearly they're only there to increase UPS and that's it. And that's a very weird thing to me. So I would prefer not to use them. Plus it makes a huge factory if you choose not to use them. And I think the factory and the builds look a lot more interesting when you don't have beacons, especially something like this that has no beacons at all, just the modules. And it can still put out 120 ingots a second. So that's another reason why I just haven't really been interested in beacons because you just don't need them. Things are plenty fast without them. Now that we covered the general idea of how they work, we can cover each ore, but pretty much every single one goes through first the ore processor to turn it into the processed ore, and then it goes through a pellet press to turn it into the pellet ore. And then what happens from there is what is different. In iron's case, you add in limestone and coke in order to get your iron ingots. And this is a great opportunity to talk about how you make limestone. It is a mud water product where you have this offshore pump here that places viscous mud water into this machine. So if you think of the offshore pump as giving you seawater, this is basically giving you the mud at the sea floor. And from there, you can take that mud water and process it up to five times. So what you would do is add water to it. You would get some amount of mud and then heavy mud water as an output. If you take that heavy mud water, add water, you'll get mud and concentrated mud water, and then light mud water, thin mud water, and then saline water. So basically you took muddy water and turned it into salt water and took all the mud out of it. And if you really want to, you can take that mud, mix it with water, and make viscous mud water. So that is a way of getting rid of mud, but there are other ways of getting rid of mud and mud is actually a high value byproduct. So you're better off saving it than just dumping it into mud water. Now saline water you've seen before, it is a byproduct of water purification and we'll deal with that later. But these other four tiers, you can take the water out instead of sending it down the chain to turn it into something else. If you process the heavy mud water and add water to it, you can get a compilation of different geodes. So this is a way of you generating geodes from nothing if you need to. And geodes also came from our stage two of ore processing earlier. You can take the concentrated mud water and turn it into clay, the light mud water and turn it into limestone. And the thin mud water can be turned into sand. We needed limestone for our iron. So that's what's going on here where tier one is processed and it just goes directly into the tier two machine directly into the tier three machine. And then all of these machines take that water and turn it into limestone. And because this is relatively easy to make, there's no reason to bus or transport things like limestone all over the factory when all you need is some water and you could make it anywhere. 
And also, covering coke is its own thing, but ultimately all of these ingots get sent either to the ingots bus or to the side in order to make steel. And steel works the same here as it does in vanilla in the sense where it takes four iron go in to make one steel on the way out. So it's incredibly needy on your iron. So these blast furnaces also have a fuel requirement. And if the input is also a fuel, it just feeds itself. And there's kind of no point into putting a different fuel in this slot and trying to make it work because if it runs out one time, then it's just gonna go back to using this. And you can see that when it's running, it actually consumes fuel quite quickly. These other ones, since they don't require a fuel for the recipe, they're running on enriched fuel blocks, which is our factory's best fuel. And it looks like these weren't connected completely at the bottom, but I guess they didn't need to be, clearly, because the belt's running out. It's just kind of funny. I don't think I can let that stand, even though it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's connected now. But it also requires an input of oxygen. And that's our first use of oxygen gas. Because we need so much of it, we are making it on site, even though we do have a pipe bus for it. And because oxygen is made from the air, you might as well make it right next to the thing that you're working on, because it can be done anywhere. So the process works by first you have an air filter that just makes compressed air from nothing, and then that compressed air goes into a chemical plant and is split into nitrogen and oxygen. The oxygen is what we need, so it's saved, and the nitrogen, being a very low value byproduct since it's everywhere in the air, it's just vented away in a flare stack. And the flare stack is the gas equivalent to the clarifier. Where a clarifier gets rid of liquidy things, the flare stack gets rid of gassy things. Currently Angel Bob's does not have a machine that gets rid of solids, that if you want to get rid of a solid you need to actually process it in some way. So with these setups here that are making mud as a byproduct, let's say you had too much mud, well a recipe does exist for you to get rid of that mud if you wanted to, even though it's bad. But you need to keep that in mind, that uh, if you have a byproduct you actually have to get rid of it somehow and solids are the most difficult. And that oxygen is made right here, so we don't have to have the difficulty of sending it across the factory. We already talked about copper, but first it's processed into pellet form, and then has that oxygen mixed in to make the anodes, and then those anodes are turned into the ingots. Lead works similarly to iron, where it requires limestone and coke, but it also requires oxygen, and then a byproduct is sulfur dioxide gas, which is sent onto the pipe bus because it's a byproduct gas and it can be turned into more acid. So we will follow that later. And then those anodes need to get mixed in with hexafluorosilic acid in order to turn into the lead ingots. And it creates a small amount of slag as a byproduct, which is sent back to the bus. The hexafluorosilic acid is a silicon product, which is actually just made all the way down here. So if you saw that machine and didn't know what it was for, that's what it's there for. Some processes are easier than others. You see like tin, for example, is incredibly simple. You make the pellets and then you put in carbon and then that's it. That's tier three of tin. <laughs> so they're not all created equal and I kind of like that. Each setup is a little different from each other and you can definitely tell where these early game setups are huge and big and have lots of machines. And then we get to the late one, like I showed you with the uh, titanium here where it's just direct inserted and there's like no belts at all. With manganese, the pellets go in and we need natural gas and that is an item of gas processing, which we'll get to later. To make manganese oxide, the manganese oxide needs to have iron added to it and sulfuric acid to make the cathodes and also a byproduct of iron hydroxide. The iron hydroxide gets coke added to it and it turns back into the iron ingots and creates carbon dioxide as a byproduct which gets sent elsewhere but it doesn't actually consume iron it just borrows it and then finally we have those cathodes which just get turned into the ingots nickel first gets turned into pellet form and then we need to make the nickel carbonyl by adding sulfur directly as well as carbon monoxide and then we need to add nickel ingots to it to make more nickel ingots so it borrows its own ingots it still is the same ratio in the end, but it's just kind of funny that it takes some to make some. Since it's relevant, we can talk about carbon monoxide, that in order to make it, you just add carbon and purified water to create carbon monoxide as an output. And this is actually another way of making purified water. I think this is probably one of the only places in the factory that I did it. Besides using a water purification plant, you can also boil water. So first we have a water pump jack which is just a way of making water from nothing rather than having to have a little square of water right here, which just in itself looks kind of dumb, so why not have a machine instead? 
and then it's sent through a boiler which takes electricity and turns that water into steam. And then that steam goes through a cooling tower and now it's purified. So that is a more direct, less byproduct type of way of making purified water, but it is more energy intensive than just using the water treatment plants. So with silicon here, we make the silicon pellets. Those are added in with aluminum and hydrogen gas to create alumina and silane gas as an output. And that silane gas is direct piped, so it's just a single pipe right here going into this machine that needs silicon ingots and the silane gas to make more ingots. So it's another process that borrows its own ingots to make more ingots. I guess it's a good time to mention that the different processes are not created equal. For example, with titanium, the tier one and tier two methods make titanium tetrachloride, which then creates titanium sponges. But the tier three of making ingots skips that altogether and doesn't even use them. So just because you're at a higher tier of a certain process, it doesn't actually mean that it's building on the previous process. It could be something completely different. And then we have our silver over here. So it comes in silver pellets and a lot gets added here. The sodium cyanide, purified water, oxygen gas, creates sodium silver cyanide and sodium hydroxide as an output. It's also making its purified water using the boiling method. And then that sodium silver cyanide is turned into the silver cathodes, which of course then are turned into the silver ingots. The one special thing for this is that sodium cyanide, because this was just needed for this process alone, it has its own little build right here. So to make it, we need to take some of that sodium hydroxide that you've been hearing about and electrolyze it using an electrode, which will create sodium and a dirty electrode, as well as some purified water. The dirty electrode can be cleaned with purified water to make a clean electrode, and it also makes mineralized water and regular water as an interesting set of byproducts. Then you take that sodium, add carbon, add these green metal catalysts, add ammonia gas, and then that creates the sodium cyanide as well as a used catalyst carrier, and hydrogen. The catalysts work in that there are four different types and they require a tiny input of ores. So for one copper and one iron, you get 10 red metal catalysts. Aluminum silver gives you 10 green, cobalt and titanium gives you 10 blue, and nickel and tungsten gives you 10 yellow. And you'll see these all over the place. And uh, you'll start to see a lot of uh, the same resources being talked about. And there's no central location for a lot of them. So a lot of these gases don't have some central repository where they go. They're just kind of put into pipes or made on site. So this setup needed some purified water to get started. So here's another way of making purified water. We added oxygen and hydrogen together to make purified water. So that's another way you can do it. But at the same time, also, instead of just getting rid of that water from a clarifier, we decided to electrolyze it by sending it into electrolyzer, which makes slag, hydrogen, and oxygen. So you can definitely be closed loop if you really want to. And then to make ammonia is a red metal catalyst with hydrogen and nitrogen. And however you get that here is up to you. So we go through all of that and it makes the sodium cyanide that we need to make silver. With aluminum, you make pellets, you add in coke, and sodium carbonate, which we'll cover later, to make the sodium aluminate. And then that goes up. You add sodium hydroxide and carbon dioxide to make alumina and some sodium carbonate back. Also, any of the alumina that was created from making silicon is sent over here. But we add carbon to the alumina and we get aluminum. To make zinc here, you add the pellets to oxygen gas to get zinc oxide and then that sulfur dioxide gas byproduct. Add sulfuric acid to it and you get the cathodes and then you know what happens to cathodes. They get turned into the ingots. And then all of this empty space and nothing here because of how tiny it is. But it is just as fast as this setup right here. It's just end game and top tier everything. So it's actually a little harder to cover because there's just one machine of everything, but so you take up the regular titanium ore and they get processed, which gets put into the pellet machine, which then gets put into the blast furnace where all of the magic happens. It requires carbon and calcium chloride and will create titanium and some extra limestone, which is being sent back to those other processes that use it. The calcium chloride is a stone product, so it's made from that crushed stone which we get from the ore bus. And you add hydrogen chloride gas to it to make the hydrogen chloride. And this isn't being sent on a belt or anything because it's needed for so few processes that it's just easier to make it where you need it. To do cobalt, 
The setup is a little bigger, but the concept is the same. Where first, it's processed ore put into the pellets, and then those pellets get sulfuric acid added to it to turn into cobalt hydroxide. And then that is added with calcium chloride to turn into cobalt oxide, and it also has its own calcium chloride machines right here. And then finally, the cobalt oxide is mixed with more carbon to make the cobalt ingots. And this is a situation where the icon does not match what's actually on the belt. So the item is fine, it's just this is the old icon and this is the new one, but they haven't been completely aligned yet, so... Some of those resources aren't being turned into ingots, they're being sent onto a drone because cobalt oxide is a component of batteries. So we need to send it elsewhere. Now with gold, we're only making it in tier 2 form. The main reason it's not tier 3 is because we just never needed it in tier 3. But how it works is you process it, then you add the chlororic acid to it to make the cathodes. That acid is made from gold ingots as well as nitric and hydrochloric acids. So it takes gold to make gold. And then at the very end, the cathodes go in and the gold comes out. If we wanted to do tier 3, we would need some more sodium cyanide, which is the same thing that went into silver, purified water and oxygen gas, which can be turned into the gold cathodes, which then are turned into ingots. And also the same thing applies to chrome here, and chrome is empty. Chrome was a byproduct, we just never made enough of it to really care about what happened to it. But nonetheless, we did process it, and it's very simple, where you process the ore, add carbon, then you get the chrome ingots, and some carbon monoxide. And right here on the end is our tungsten setup, and we actually have three of them because we needed so much of it. But how it works is you turn it into pellet form, add ammonia gas, which makes the tungsten oxide. So it has its own ammonia gas maker because ammonia is easy to make, so there's no reason to pipe it around the factory. You add the hydrogen fluoride gas to this to make tungsten hexafluoride gas, and then that will create your tungsten powder and more fluorite, which can be turned into more acid. Doing this does save a lot of it. This does create some byproducts, so it has its own water treatment plant that's creating purified water as a result, and the way we're getting rid of it is actually electrolyzing the purified water back into hydrogen and oxygen to be sent elsewhere, potentially to be turned back into water. And the way we make the hydrogen fluoride gas is just hydrofluoric acid goes in, and we basically take the water out of it. <laughs> <laughs> where we get gas and the wastewater as a byproduct. And that's most of it. The last thing on the end you're probably quite eager to see is processing uranium, but that is a setup for another time because it's its own thing. So we will cover it, just not right now, and the same with the thorium here. So those are all of the processes in order to make the ingots. And finally, we have all of these sorting warehouses and all of these ingots on the ingot bus to be set to where they need to go. So you went through all that work to make all these ingots and you didn't directly attach them to the setup that makes plates. So let's talk about why. Well, it, like in the case of iron here, you have multiple ways of doing it. And that is covered in the metallurgy casting recipes here. The first step of making plates is you take those ingots and you melt them down into say molten iron. And you have a couple of choices on what to do. You can turn the molten iron directly into the plate. However, you can also turn them into sheet coils. And a coil is like a four times dense form of plate. So you see here, if you had a coil and you chopped it up, you would get four plates out of it. So in the beginning, you're probably running on plates. However, in the end, you really want to put them into coils because it makes them four times as dense for the same size of belt. So from now on, when I'm talking about making plates or anything like that, I'm actually talking about making coils. The plates are made where they're actually needed, and we'll cover why in a second. And one thing that's cool is if you hover over the molten metal, you will get the temperature that it's at. So iron melts at 1538 degrees Celsius, but many materials have multiple recipes for making that molten material. So the most direct way of making molten iron is simply to add iron ingots to it. However, you can add half iron and half manganese. And these recipes kind of expand, so you see that 12 ingots go in and 120 molten iron come out. Well, here it's 12 plus 12 gives you 240, so you're not losing anything there. However, what it does do is it cuts down the amount of iron that needs to go into this by half. It's still the same number of resources in the end, but it just depends on, is that resource rare? So since you need so much iron in the game, that cutting down your iron by half by mixing it in with something that's a lot easier to make, like manganese, 
is a pretty good deal. And for most of these, not all of them, but for the most part, as the tier goes up, it's a better deal for you. So usually you wanna do the highest tier of whatever's available, but not always. Obviously you'd wanna think about it, but usually it's in your best interest. So like tier three is iron and silicon, and that's the same ratio as with manganese. But at the time you unlock this recipe, manganese is harder to make than silicon is, so you probably would want to get rid of your silicon. It just depends. However, tier four is a triple mixture of cobalt, iron, and nickel. So now the amount of iron that's going in is only a third of the total mixture. And that's really powerful, especially because end game, you barely need nickel and you only need a little bit of cobalt, but you need a huge amount of iron. So by doing this, you're able to stretch the iron you do have even further. And then tier five is similar, but it replaces that cobalt with chrome. And we're not doing this recipe simply because we never went down the chrome route because it's, chrome's actually quite hard to make and it just never seems worth it to me. And you can see this going on here where we have the machines that are just running on iron itself, the ones that are using iron plus the silicon, iron plus the manganese, and then the ones that are using the cobalt, nickel, and iron mixture. And one other thing to mention is that the machines are the same speed regardless of how many inputs go in. So if you see it's four seconds for 120 molten iron with just iron, it's the same four seconds, but now you get 240 molten iron and the same four seconds, but now you get 360. So from a number of machines and from an electricity standpoint, it is more efficient to do the recipes that require higher combinations of ingots. So the reason why we have this ingot bus is because all of these ingots can go to all of these different combinations of alloys. And we don't know which one the factory would want. So we hooked up all of them and then have all of this logic attached to it. And covering all of it is probably outside the scope of this review here. But with this poll, you see we do have these signals of all of our ores and originally our bus had a hard time staying balanced and not being overloaded on any resource. So what the signal was doing is it was saying, hey, are we overloaded on cobalt? If so, run this recipe in order to get rid of that clog. But now that we're in the end game and can reliably create all of these resources, now instead it's less about getting rid of extra resources and more about maximizing the resources we do have. So it's kind of funny to look at these four lines of iron right here that can make an incredible amount if we could feed them 211 iron a second and that 211 iron could make 633 iron plates if it was mixed with this recipe so that kind of shows you how far you can expand your production by using these alloys one problem with alloys and any other setup is that more and more has to work correctly for you to actually create your output so for this recipe to work, it means everything related to cobalt and everything related to nickel needs to be okay. So there's more points of failure compared to this one, which only requires iron and manganese, and this one, which only requires iron. This is why our ore sorting bus has all of these methods running, or at least available to run. Not necessarily that they always go. To make tier one is pretty easy, but to make tier two requires that tier one is working correctly, plus more of the factory to make tier three requires that tier two is working correctly, plus more of the factory. Tier four requires that tier three is working correctly. And in this case, no more of the factory because all it does is ore goes in and ore goes out. But you see how the higher the tier and the more processing that you do on any given resource, the higher the likelihood that something in the factory is going to cause a delay. And our way of dealing with that is by having multiple methods available to run, even if none of them are currently running. We just want to have the option there. And there's different circuit network logic attached to all of this to give them all priorities. So when they run, they don't all simultaneously run, but the one with highest priority, in this case with iron, with this triple mixture, will try to run first. And if this can't run, then these other ones will pick up the slack. And steel works very similarly to iron, where it has the same recipes pretty much identically. The exception is the tier three of the molten steel, which now requires tungsten powder instead of nickel. And tungsten is quite a rare resource at this point, so not really worth it to do. But there's the molten steel temperature of 1,370 degrees. And I guess it looks like it is running a little bit. So while we're here, we can talk about how you make coils. They all work the same way. There's two tiers of coils. The first one requires that molten input and some water. So it's four seconds of crafting time gives you 
two coils. Well, there is a tier two that requires coolant as an input. However, the ratio gets a little better where this one would require 160 steel to make four coils. This one only requires 140 steel to make four coils. So you get a slight material advantage, but also it's even better than that because the crafting time is half but you get twice as many resources as an output. So instead of four seconds for two, it's two seconds for four. So the setups become much more dense and energy efficient if you're using coolant. So there's no reason not to. So how does it work? You have the molten metal, which goes in. It creates coils on the way out. You also need to add coolant and that creates used hot coolant on the way out. However, you need to cool the coolant in order to use it again. And there are three stages to this. First, the hot coolant goes in, you add water, which creates cooler coolant, as well as a little bit of steam. You take that cooler coolant and make it even cooler by doing the same thing. And you take the cooler coolant and make it cold coolant. <laughs> Probably should use different terms by setting it through one more time. And after you do this three times, now instead of being 300 degrees, it is 25 degrees and I am just using the steam for electricity. It's it's very poor steam So it doesn't make very much but you could turn it into other things if you wanted to for example You can condense it into purified water if that's what you wanted to do But I figured I would just make it disappear by turning it into steam and now that you have that cold coolant You can add a filter to it in this case another ceramic filter to turn it back into regular coolant however 200 goes in but only 160 comes out so in the end you still need to supply fresh coolant from wherever you're making it and that's what this is here for and we will cover that later coolant is a product of mineral oil it's lubricant adjacent and pretty much every coil setup works the same way so you see they all look pretty much the same that's because they all more or less use the same recipe some of them are different and we will cover that for one certain alloys cannot be turned into coils at all and they also don't have any alternate recipes either. In order to make invar, you add steel and nickel together, and then you can put it through a casting machine, which just turns it into the plate form as opposed to the coil form. But as a part of the mod, the coils aren't there. I think there is other mods which add the coils in for these, but with straight angel bobs, invar does not come in coil form. And cobalt steel is cobalt mixed in with steel, as you would guess. So let's cover everything else now. This machine on the end, we do actually have it set up because we made a couple of chrome ingots at some point in the factory. So this is the machine that just processed those and put them into making our iron. Copper does not have any alloys. You just have to put copper ingots in and get copper on the way out and hopefully it's enough. So it is definitely a big numbers material. And you can see that a lot of these machines have been upgraded to make those big numbers. However, one interesting thing about copper is I'm sure if you've played Factorio, you are aware that you need a lot of copper cable. Well, this saves you some logistics. You can actually put the copper cable into coil form and send them that way. And that greatly simplifies a lot of your electronics building setups. So we have two sets here of machines. One is making these copper sheet coils, which are turned into plates. And the other one is making the copper wire coils. But the way that they work is identical. And now we have a couple more alloys that cannot come in coil form. The first one here is bronze. And you can make bronze in a couple of different ways. The first here is just copper and tin. And then tier two is copper, nickel, and tin. And then tier three is copper, tin, and zinc. As far as which one of those is the best, well, it almost doesn't matter because you don't really make very much of any of these. So I haven't paid much mind to it after these were built. So the second one is brass here, which tier one is copper and zinc. And tier two is copper, tin, and zinc. There is a third tier, which is copper, lead, and zinc, but I never felt the need to add it in. And the last one is gunmetal which we use the very least of. This essentially goes into ammunition, essentially. That's about it. It's used in very little. And the recipe to make it is copper, tin, and zinc. Back to coils again, that we can search wire, that there are essentially four tiers of wires that you will need to make. The first one is, of course, the copper wire, but quickly you will find yourself needing to make tinned copper wire, and that's just copper wire with tin plates. However, you can make this in coil form, which saves you two extra steps, which is kind of nice. And then at some point you'll need to make silver wire, but you can also make silver wire coils. And then also you'll need to make gold wire, but you can make gold wire coils. So this first one here is making the tinned wire. And 
This is the first one where instead of making an alloy, you actually have to input the two metals separately. So we have one with tin and one with copper, and neither of those have any different options for how you turn them into liquid. So there's no alloys there. You just put in tin, put in copper, and you get the tinned wire coils. And over here, we're also making tinned coils for when we need plates. And then this is our solder making machine. And of course, there are many ways of making solder. Tier one is lead and tin. Tier two is tin and zinc. And tier three is copper, silver, and tin. We melt those down into molten solder, and then that gets turned into solder coils. And lead has no alloys. It's just you melt it down, turn it into coils. And now we're at silicon, and silicon is a different one. The way this is done is first we take the silicon ingots and melt it down. Some of that is added with nitrogen gas to make a monosilicon seed. Also, we take regular silicon, so not the ingots, but the raw ore, to turn it into a quartz crucible. And then we take all of that, mix it together to create the monosilicon, and most of the quartz crucible will come back. And the monosilicon is the final output. There is no coil form, but it almost doesn't matter because when it comes to silicon, you can get six silicon wafers out of one monosilicon. So that's even better than what a coil would be. So in this case, uh, that's perfectly fine. And you actually unlock those quite early. And now we have titanium here, which there are four methods. First tier is just titanium. Second tier is manganese and titanium. Third tier is nickel and titanium. And then fourth tier is aluminum tin and titanium, and there is a fifth tier, which I haven't added in, but that is a chrome one, which is chrome, cobalt, and titanium. And then we have gold, and gold has no alloys, so it just creates gold. And then we have our gold wires, and silver unlocks first, just the way these machines were set up as I built these first, but gold is the highest tier of wire. But you melt down copper, melt down gold, put those in separately into the machine to make the gold wires. And then we have a silver maker right here for making the silver coils. And then to make the silver wires is copper and silver. Aluminum one is just aluminum. Aluminum two is aluminum plus manganese. And then that aluminum three is the aluminum, copper, and silicon. And then we have nickel here. It's used for very specific and limited things, but nonetheless, we do need it in plate form. So nickel goes in and it's turned into coils. The same applies to zinc, it's used for very little. Nickel basically goes into RoboPort components, that's about it. And zinc goes into very little, it goes into batteries and like nuclear fuel cells, and that's about it. Both of those are used for very little. And then now at the end, we are making some of our alloys that don't use coils. Right here, we are turning silicon powder and nitrogen gas into silicon nitride, which we need in enormous quantities in the factory. And that powder is simply made from silicon ingots being ground down. And then a high tier structural material is nitinol, and that is just made with nickel and titanium. And now we're into our tungsten components here. And tungsten is the weird one that has no ingot form that when it comes out of the machine, it just comes in tungsten powder form. And that is how it's used. It just doesn't come in ingots. So for one, you don't need to grind it down. But for two, it's usually used in some sort of alloy. It's not often used directly as itself. There are two tiers of it. One uses tungsten powder and one uses tungsten oxide. Tungsten oxide is like a middle step for tungsten. So it's much nicer to do it just with the powder itself. But you add in carbon, add in tungsten, and you get a tungsten carbide plate. And we have lots of machines working on that. And then here, if you want to make copper tungsten plate, you add the tungsten powder and copper plates to it. And this is actually an interesting example to show you how you turn the coils into plate form. And I call them plate choppers. I suppose it's more accurate to call them coil choppers. But anyway, the input is the sheet coil and the output is the plates. And most importantly, you can use productivity modules in these machines. So you can only use the modules one place in the process of making the plates. You can either use it when you're turning it into plates from like a plate casting machine or right here on the assembly machine that chops it into plate form. You cannot put them into the machines that make them in coil form. And then here on the end, sometimes we just need straight up tungsten plates. And the way that is made is with a tungsten powder mixture and you have two choices here. The tier one requires cobalt powder 
and tungsten powder be mixed together. And the tier two, you can do it with nickel powder. And that probably is better because at the end, cobalt you use in moderate quantities, but you barely use nickel for anything. So the second tier is probably the best one. So that basically covers a pretty big chunk of the factory. We went through our processing the raw ores right here, sorting them, which was here, and then turning them into ingot form, which was right here, and then turning them into coil form, which was all of this. So we still have a lot of factory to cover, but this was the biggest, most complicated part of it. So if you can handle this, you could probably handle anything Angel Bobs can throw at you. But it's also the secret to why the factory can put out such an incredible amount of materials, because you might see like our output of copper here, and it's going reasonably fast here. Well, this kind of gives you an idea. We're making 16 or 17,000 copper plates a minute. And divided by 60 tells us that we are making 266 copper plates a second. But then you're looking at this output and you're like, that's not 260 copper a second. And you're like, no, it isn't. Because of all of the productivity modules that you can layer and also just the processes that you can layer on top of themselves. But to show it in the biggest form, we should probably cover iron. So on top of all of the other bonuses you get with technology, in the end, you need to chop that iron down into plate form. And if you do, and use all productivity modules in a tier six machine, which is as high as it goes, you will get a 240% productivity bonus, which is pretty good. So let's cover how all of this technology layers on itself to add to your productivity. Let's just assume we're looking at how many plates does one iron give us? Well, if we smelted it right here, we would get one iron plate. However, by putting it through the second tier of ore processing, we turn that one iron into two ingots, or essentially two iron plates. And then, by using the best possible method with molten iron by mixing cobalt and nickel together, now those two iron ingots have created six iron plates. However, because we're using coolant, we get a slight percent bonus, and it's around 14% bonus, I think, because we don't need to put all of it in there to make a coil. So six times 1.14 means we're at 6.84 and that is in coil form so we would have to chop it but remember that we will get a 240 percent productivity bonus by putting it through a plate chopper with a maximum number of productivity modules so times 3.4 for the bonus that it would give us now for each iron ore that comes through this belt it will create 23.26 plates on the other side, or the equivalent of plates if it's not being used in plate form. And the productivity is slightly better than that because you can use productivity modules in the machines that are actually making the ores. You can use up to three in the highest tier of ore sorting facilities. So it doesn't have iron as an input, it has these other ones and they're used at one to one ratio, but let's just assume the number is the same where this is another 120% productivity bonus on top of this. So what this means is for every one ore, be it sapphirite or jivalite, that goes into these ore sorters, and when you see it runs, it gives you an idea, it will turn into the equivalent of 51.16 iron plates at the end point wherever they happen to be used. So it's really important that you use all of these methods because it really helps the logistics to where at the back end, you can have single trains and single train stations, like with gold here, it doesn't look like much when you see just a little bit of gold coming out of this, but it's actually quite a lot. As it turns out, productivity modules are pretty good and it doesn't matter what version of Factor you're playing. <laughs> but it's not just the productivity modules. It's also a huge amount of it is alloying your materials to lessen the load on the thing that you need a bunch of with things you don't need a bunch of. And it's also spending the time going through all of these processing methods to make your input ores go further. And also, also, it's about using ore mixtures to lessen the load on individual ores by spreading them around across all of your various requirements. So the name of the game is taking those six input resources and spreading the load as well as you can across your factory so no individual setup is overtaxed while also supplying all of your needs. Well, that took a while. I was, uh, worried it would be a long one <laughs> and we're only 
a little bit of the way through the factory tour, because there's a lot of factory I haven't even touched on yet. But this was an important one, and it was also covering one specific thing, which might be a little better than me just jumping around talking about everything. I would say that if you were looking for an explanation for how angels or sorting worked, you now know, because I covered just about all of it. So hopefully you found that useful, but that's going to have to be the end of this episode. And on the next one, we will continue our giant factory tour and cover something else. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.